So, so do take a look. Um, so next up, we've got the uh, the guys from the Cambridge Design Partnership, Ben and Sturgios. I can't sort of uh, see him, but uh, so we've heard a lot over the past uh, 24 hours about design, about culture, about people, about process, and. These guys are going to talk to us today about how it all weaves together um, to create innovation success. Thank so. you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Gillian, may you move a lot? I'm a terrible dancer, so um, I'm just going to try and make you hungry instead. Um, no apologies for the, the shameless product positioning. We partner with Pyrex to design their Centenary Edition uh, 2015 oven glassware. Big innovation challenge, single part molding, same material that's been used for 100 years. If you want to know more about that, um, come and see me over a coffee. So um, today we're going to reflect a little bit on, um, we've heard about process, we've heard about culture, we've heard about creativity, and we just want to talk about some of our observations of bringing those things together for more consistent innovation success. It's. Um, a privilege to, to follow Gillian and, and a little bit daunting actually and I probably should have checked the next little section with her before um, before I, I talk to you guys about it but um, you know hopefully it's a fortuitous segue because of course generating effective multi-sensory cues and experiences is central to the work that we do as, as designers and researchers. Cirque is, is probably one of the most successful innovators in the world in entertainment. I mean they have hit after hit after hit and um, Gillian keep me straight here I think of the 30 or so shows that you guys have ever produced, something like 20 are still running in the world? 24. Okay, I mean, extraordinary. I mean, if they were a product company, who, who would we compare them to? I mean, Dyson, Apple, Tesla. Um, you know, so the consistency of their success, uh, you know, suggests that for all this breathtaking creativity and diversity, there's something formulaic about the way that they go about innovation, right? So, you know, what can we learn from that? And I've taken the liberty of drawing a few parallels between the things that these guys do and what we do in our line of product development. Um, so I read a fascinating interview recently, again, sorry, you keep me straight if it goes wrong, right, with uh, Daniel Lamar, who's the CEO, and Guy Le Liberté, who's the creative director, talking about how they define the theme of their next show. And apparently it starts out with a very broad vision. Sometimes it's even a single word uh, rather than a confined mandate. And this is to allow everyone to contribute uh, equally to... Uh, to oh. There we go. Uh, to bring the different uh, perspectives together. Apparently, they were very tradition, uh, very dismissive of traditional brainstorming techniques. This this idea of no idea is a bad idea. You know, everyone in a state of happy agreement. Actually, you know, that's not a good thing. Instead, what they do is actively foster an environment of, of a sort of creative friction. Uh, you know, a bit of friction during the ideation process was actually advocated as more likely to lead to some sort of innovation breakthrough. Apparently, once a theme is decided upon, these guys step back and they let the creative director and the troupe take over at that point, developing the concept over two to three years. So quite long time frames. Remember, this is breakthrough innovation going on here. Building a lot of evidence, prototyping, iterating, on which to found the ultimate success. They review progress every six months or so, looking at the quality side of things, quality control, and making sure that it unfolds ultimately within uh, the original vision. And in order to encourage this collaboration, they don't dictate changes, they just point out what's not going right and they let the creative uh, lead and the troupe sort it out themselves. I really like some of these things. I mean, you know, not departing from the original division, in, uh, original vision, empowering the team. You know, I mean, how many, how many products in history have been flops because the design by committee vanilla departure has come away from the original division? You know, how many amazing things have been done by innovation teams in that flow state that we heard about yesterday, you know, driven by insight and coffee and passion? So, you know, I think this is really exciting. Did I get all of that just about right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, the, the, the strange thing is that despite this clear case study of businesses who, who do this stuff very well, incremental and breakthrough innovation. Um, there isn't as much consistency as we would expect when you look across you know, wider business, when you look at R&D spend and return on investment. And I'm going to show a graph. I'm really sorry about that, <laughs> but it's a good one. So, Anyone seen this before? It's a few years old, but I think it's still relevant to us. So this was put together by Booz Allen Hamilton, who are management consultants. And they did a study a few years ago of the top 1,000 innovators, top spenders in R&D, and indexed their spend to sales with their sales growth. 
So what I think we'd expect to see is some sort of correlation between the amount of money they spend on R&D and their return on investment, right? Okay. What, what it actually shows is that there's a massive scatter. Okay. Some people are very, very good at this. They spend relatively little for great return on investment. Some people are really bad at it. So, um, you know, I think that this sort of graph has given rise to this idea of a fuzzy front end. And that phrase makes me really mad. I hate the idea of a fuzzy front end. It isn't fuzzy. It can be very systematic. So yes, you know, there's high stakes. There's a lot of competition, difficult circumstances in Europe and so on. But, and, and we know, of course, the tolerance for risk within our businesses is much lower than it ever has been before. But, you know, not surprisingly, my observation over 17 years of working with businesses ranging from startups to multi billion dollar global brands is that actually the guys that are working above this line are doing some things consistently, and the guys below it are not doing some of those things. And I just want to talk about a couple of what I think are the most important things within that. So the first one is process. And this has to focus on application and execution, on creating consumer experiences which clearly deliver against desired outcomes. The second one is culture, fostering the conditions to allow creativity to thrive in your organization. So first, the process. There can be very few businesses out there that don't use process in varying degrees to get products and services to market, right? The problem is not the processes, but actually how they're applied, or sometimes the timing of the application of those processes. And often problems start right at the front end. Take StageGate. Anyone use StageGate? Yeah, pretty familiar, okay. The problem is that StageGate represents good practice for getting a selected idea through to launch. But how do you know you've got the right idea? How do you know you've got the best idea, right? You know, how do you know that you're going to place your not inconsiderable stakes on an opportunity that will give you the return that you're looking for? The reality is, in many cases, companies don't know. And the decisions are being made on anecdotes brought back by the sales team, or market hunches, or you know, the highest paid person in the room, that sort of stuff. I don't know if that's sounding familiar. Um, you know, the problem is that the stage gate doesn't tell you where you should be spending your ideation efforts. You know, and testament to this is that Bob Cooper, the guy who developed StageGate, has actually re uh, uh, re-updated his thinking recently to, uh, to really focus on the importance of inputs to the process. So, of course, we're all going to be under pressure all the time from the product road, the brand plan, and so on. But, of course, speed to market is always critical. But unless we spend the time up front really looking at what we're trying to achieve, uh, then we're going to have problems. So the key challenge is, is where do these early, underdeveloped concepts come from? How, how should we generate them? And regardless of what realization and validation process we're subsequently going to follow, we need to know what the products and service challenges are that we need to solve. So we have to focus on the front end. It has to be holistic, it has to be evidence-based, and it has to be creative. And of course, we can make it systematic. So, Let's develop a front-end process before we get downstream. We have to step back from this pressure of creating product and service concepts as early as possible in the process and look at defining the opportunity right at the front end. So I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. What if we talked about developing and concept testing evidence-based, solution-independent, solution-independent concepts for a new experience right at the front end. What if we could segment for how well needs could be satisfied long before we actually define the concepts themselves? And this is perfectly possible, okay? I'm gonna show you how. I'm hoping that everyone is familiar with that, right? We're professional innovators, everyone knows that stuff, yeah? Good. That's the lowest level of the ladder of the innovation process I want to talk about. So many, many companies define their markets in terms of what surrounds them, okay? What's going on? The products that fit in this picture. They use voice of the customer to find out, you know, what customers like or dislike of around current product experiences and alternatives within the category. I can almost guarantee that if you take that approach, you will only ever lead to incremental or marginal gains over whatever, it, whatever exists at the moment, which is fine if your strategy calls for incremental innovation. But if you want breakthrough stuff, this isn't going to cut the mustard. The other downside of this sort of engagement with customers is that you can have other negative repercussions of that. So companies conclude that maybe customers shouldn't be involved in the process at all. Um, you know, maybe technology push or other inputs should drive the whole process, which is clearly flawed. 
Now, it is, of course, entirely plausible that customers don't know what they want, right? How can we expect them to come up with the future? However, they do know what they're trying to achieve. That other product or service that they bought, that was the one that was helping them to better undertake their job to be done. Everyone familiar with this one? Okay, job to be done thinking. Ted Levitt, Harvard professor, economist, realized this. I think quarter inch hole is probably a bit more punchy than 6.35 millimeter. Um, but um, anyway, it makes a really great point, doesn't it? Okay, this most famous of insights really promotes a different way of thinking. And Clayton Christensen went even further. Everyone familiar with this one? Customers, people and companies have jobs that arise regularly and need to get done. So when customers become aware of a job that they need to get done in their lives, they look around for a product or service that they can hire to get the job done. This is how customers experience life. So we have jobs that we need to get done. How does this work in practice? Let's take listening to recorded music. So customers have a set of metrics against which they judge products and service solutions, and we call these metrics or measures of value desired outcomes, okay? So when I'm listening to recorded music, I might want to avoid missing the start of a track, reduce the time to select a track, know which artist is performing, and so on and so on. Many tens, maybe even hundreds of desired functional and emotional outcomes. These are precise, solution-independent statements of need. So we have our job, we have our customer, we have our product, and it's important to recognize that people are loyal to getting the job done. The job, not the product or the service, is a more relevant unit of research. It therefore follows that actually we can innovate or create value by devising products and services that allow people to better undertake those jobs, right? So we need to satisfy their desired outcomes. So, if anyone is unconvinced, let me show you how stable this job unit of analysis is and how it can provide a platform for innovation, not just the next product, but actually a platform for innovation for the future. Products can be very transient. Gramophone, record player, cassette player, CD player, MP3 player. And they can be disrupted. Spotify, streaming, Wi-Fi, and so on, okay? So if we take the job approach, it actually can make us rethink the markets, rethink what we're doing for our consumers. So to summarize, a job to be done is a stakeholder goal, an aspiration, a friction, or a pain point. It's composed of functional, emotional, and social dimensions. And it's a foundation for an opportunity specification. We haven't defined what the product looks like yet. We haven't created a nice picture or chosen the materials yet. It's part of the specification. How can we use this stuff to support us in the busy lives that we have? Well, firstly, we can come up with new products and services. We can see the whole new product development pipeline. It provides a platform. The second really exciting thing about this is it helps us redefine our marketing messaging because if we understand what is really important to consumers, then we can tell them what's so good about our new products. It helps us define the messaging. The third one is that it helps us reprioritize our R&D pipeline. So maybe there's some hidden gem down there. It's currently you know, number 25 on the list of new projects that's coming through. How do we know that that number 25 should in fact be number one? This happened with Stents, Cordis. It was way down in their pipeline. They did this stuff. They suddenly realized that actually this was the future. And actually within a year, I think it was doing a billion dollars. I mean, extraordinary stuff. So three really important ways of, of using this. Let's, let's follow this through a little bit further. So if we take the product view of video rental, everyone, everyone familiar with Blockbuster? Yeah, I should put a cobweb probably on the Blockbuster sign there. Okay, if we take the product view, how can we possibly look beyond video rental? If we look at the job to be done, watch a movie at home, then suddenly we start thinking in a different way, right? So Netflix, hello, goodbye Blockbuster. Let's look at cutting the grass. Product view gives us the lawnmower, right? Or whatever mechanical device it is. Okay, let's just be a bit more objective. Let's step back. What's the job to be done? Maintaining the length of the lawn. Is it possible that a Monsanto-type business could come up 
and just kill the lawnmower market overnight, right? They create a nice lawn, a seed that grows to that length and looks great all year round. Why do we want a lawnmower? Who enjoys mowing the grass, right? Are these guys thinking like this? I don't, I don't know. But it's interesting to follow it through. How many people have a cup of coffee during the day? <coughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> How do we see this coffee? Is it a product or a job to be done? Okay, so we've got the products. Job to be done. Work on the go. Probably many, many others. I mean, we could think of a ton of other things that that coffee does for us during the day. So as humans and individuals, we want something probably from our 8 a.m. cup to our 11 a.m. cup to our 3 p.m. cup to our 9 p.m. cup. There's different stuff going on. We have, we have different contexts, occasions, and we have different functional and emotional jobs to be done. So it's the same product though, isn't it, yeah? Coffee. But we have the espresso for the hit, the latte for the indulgence. You know, we have the long hot drink to relax, to socialize with friends and so on, all for different contexts. So it figures that if you try and segment me by traditional socioeconomic methods, 38-year-old white guy, lives in Cambridge, professional, you are gonna completely fail to understand all of the things on a granular level that drive my contextual decisions, my perceptions, my emotional needs and functional needs, and therefore the products and services that I hire to get the jobs done. So the beauty about this approach is that if you cut that all back and look at the jobs to be done, you can start innovating in new ways. So coffee market, right? It's absolutely saturated. How much coffee is there out there? And yet I came across this one recently. So this is nitrogen gassed cold coffee on draft. What a cool idea, eh? So this is relaxing with friends in the afternoon. I mean, this is borrowed shamelessly from craft beer, right? I mean, it is, it is beer. In, I mean, even the guy with the tattoos, I mean, like, that's beer, isn't it? It's a different social occasion, different context, different needs, different functions, different jobs to be done. Uh, you know, and that gives us the platform for innovating in that space. The other beautiful thing about this approach, I talked about marketing messaging earlier on, it's not only new products and service propositions, but the purity of this thinking allows us to create very, very impactful 2D, 3D messaging. Because when it's presented, it is so natural to connect with what the jobs are to be done. I mean, we get it, don't we? Like, CAF, decaf. I mean, it's just so natural. We've understood what the job's to be done and the consumers get it. So how can we use this deep understanding of the sensory sciences, the jobs to be done, and, and our creative skills to further optimize design solutions? So recent research has, has into psychology has uh, shed new light on how we make decisions. Two parts of the brain involved, as, as you all probably know. Unexpectedly, the dominant one, the one that helps us make decisions, is actually the affective or the emotional side of the brain. And the logical bit of our brain actually is much slower and doesn't necessarily get the final say in the decision-making process, which obviously can have a dramatic effect on the decisions that we ultimately make. But you know, emotions are much harder to understand, and, and it's weird because some companies are very surprised when technically superior products don't do as well in the market as, as other ones that are just more appealing. They do something to us inside. So what we need to do is to systematically understand and qualify how those emotions impact in our, on our decision-making process. Sturgios ran an experiment a few years ago uh, with orange juice, and um, they looked at how 3D brand structure, materials, and so on impacted on consumers' uh, perceptions of flavor. And unfortunately, we don't have time to go into it today, but if you want to know about the experiments, and you can probably guess at what the results were, he's here all day. Please go and have a chat to him over coffee. So based on effective design principles, in my view, uh, this image from a well-known brand, I'm really sorry if the brand manager is here today, um, yeah, <laughs> doesn't give exactly the right messages. I mean, I don't know about you, when I'm feeling, feeling like this, even a tissue feels like sandpaper. So the idea of sticking a drill bit up my nose uh, is, I mean, maybe your cold is so bad that you need to drill a quarter inch hole, I, I, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> you know, we're putting across some of the wrong messages here. You know, this guy is probably feeling pretty poorly. He's at the pharmacy he's looking at this thing, it's not going to be giving him the sort of feelings that he probably wants to help him recover from this cold. So I'm, I'm kind of joking about this, but, but the really important thing for you guys, particularly the people making formulations, is to understand that actually you can change consumers' perceptions of the flavor or the efficacy of your formulation by changing what the packaging is doing for people in an effective way. 
and it might be in medications case, for example, of care or efficacy or so on. So we're building up all of this evidence, understanding jobs to be done, needs, all of that stuff. Now we need to combine that with strategy. Mans, all of that big stuff, micro, what's important to you strategically, where are you going, direction, and so on. And also technology, technology landscaping, scouting, mapping, and so on. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing near term or long term, combining all of this stuff is really important. Having researchers and designers involved in this very early stage is critically important because at some point you've got to translate that early insight into product and service solutions. Which brings me on to culture. I made reference earlier to this idea of positive friction. How does this play out in new product development? There are a lot of great myths uh, about uh, creativity and the neuroscience of creativity, and Gillian alluded to a few earlier on. I mean, it's, it's a great topic in itself, maybe one for another day, but there are some crackers out there. Some people are genetically born creative. That creativity is the domain of a hallowed few and everyone else should stay away from creativity. Brilliant ideas just come spontaneously by magic. One of my favorites, the expert. You know, if you have a really hard problem, you go and get an expert. If it's a really, really hard problem, you get an even more expert expert. Yeah, what you need to do is actually get someone who knows nothing about the subject, who doesn't care, who's going to come in and throw a firework into your creative process. Positive friction is about building a team of people with different perspectives, who have a healthy respect for each other, but don't dance around the issues, okay? Dancing, that's my dancing analogy. That's about as close as I'm going to get up here. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give you an anecdote. Back at our office in Cambridge, there's 80 of us, scientists, engineers, designers, consumer researchers. We all sit jumbled up in the same office, right? So I'm sitting next to an electronics guy and a software guy. Do you know what we do every six months? We move them all around. There's two advantages to that. One, it clears out all the crap, actually. It makes everyone have a good clear-up. Um, but the other advantage is that actually these people start having new relationships, hearing new conversations. You know, actually the software guy sitting next to me starts to hear about the research we were doing in New York last week. These people start to become more holistic, more multidisciplinary in their thinking, more open-minded to working together solutions. They build social relationships. You know, social relationships are really important. We spend so much time at work. So it helps with all this sort of new perspective piece. Uncovering need, as we talked about earlier on, is only part of the story. And what we need to do is, as I say, now translate into new products and services. And these research and design lenses are fundamentally different. Why? Because researchers and designers see and hear the same things differently. So I'm, I'm a designer. And my, despite my subsequent training and research, I can't help but hear desired outcomes and start imagining what the solutions can be. Sturgios is a researcher. He doesn't care about what the product's going to look like. He just is focused utterly on trying to extract those huge lists of desired functional and emotional outcomes. So we hear and see the same stuff differently. And what's critically important now, we're all in this race to the market, is to move as quickly as possible from understanding through translation and into the new product development pipeline that we all know and love. And um, actually, we are big advocates of having clients come with us too, where it's not going to change the research or the client or the uh, respondent behavior as well, because it's really important for you guys as well to hear. And I've been in situations where we've been out doing ethnographic research, and the client's been with us, and we've seen something really exciting, unusual, surprising. We've gone back, presented a report, and some senior VP has said, I do not believe that someone said that. And luckily, the client says, shut up, I was there, I saw it, I heard it, which is you know, really, really powerful and, and certainly helps promote change. So I need to start to bring this to a close. Uh, apologies if I've meandered a little bit. I, I want to bring it back to the two most important things that I think you can do. So it's develop a process which focuses on application and execution, on the creation of a consumer experience which delivers against the desired outcomes, the jobs to be done that we focused on earlier on, and culture, fostering conditions to allow innovation to thrive in your organization. Take a look at your process and ask yourselves, is it overly constraining? Is it overly prescriptive in its current form? Or does it provide you with a structure for the opportunity to pivot, to change, to move, to iterate, where necessary to do so.
In particular, are you spending wisely at the front end in order to make savings in time and money downstream? Kill the losers! Projects, not people. <laughs> Set them free. Sounds brutal, and actually you need to be. Part of product development, successful product development, is actually killing the stuff that's taking up your valuable time and money when you should be focusing your efforts elsewhere. Identify your winners with more rigor. Weed out those low value opportunities, let them die. It'll save you time and money and allow you to focus on the big, big opportunities. Take a look at the product and service that you're selling and say not what products am I selling, but actually, what job am I doing for my customers? Jobs to be done. What job am I doing for my customers? What specifications for new concepts are you creating that will better meet the emotional and functional needs and, and, and importantly, initially, please in a solution independent way? That's really, really important. Ask yourselves, are you doing everything you can to create a multidisciplinary team and culture of collaborative, positive friction? Your team needs to be challenging the biggest risks first, biggest challenges, and of course each other as well, working together. Maybe it starts next Monday with that desk move. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Brilliant, Ben. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be uh, a few questions. Or not. <laughs> or not. I'll kick us off then. Um, very interesting in terms of the... Uh, no, no, stay, stay, stay. Don't run away. It's not going to be that hard. Um, in terms of the job to be done and the different elements, is there, an, uh, is there a sort of way of prioritising as well? Because it seems to me that within each job, you've mentioned listening to music, yeah. there are a number of different elements. Yeah. We can't necessarily solve them all. So how do you kind of go about yeah, figuring it's a, out... It's, it's a great question. So actually, it's a combination of, of qual and quant research. So you go you do the call, you meet with people, deep ethnographic stuff, observe in the homes, wherever the context scenario is. The research team and the design team gather all of those emotional and functional jobs to be done, and then we take that away, and then we run big statistical quant research, so hundreds of respondents in relevant markets globally and so on. And actually through that quant research, we can then prioritize and rank all the most important jobs to be done. So we're, we're looking for um, how well satisfied current jobs are and where the opportunity space in, uh, in terms of desired outcomes. So actually that quant research will allow many hundreds of customers to allow you to prioritize and rank the most important Jobs. Yeah. So your innovation should focus clearly on the most important ones. Top ones. Great, thank you. Any more? Lady down here. You really went aggressively with that. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, what do you mean by positive friction? Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I, we probably all have different interpretations of positive friction. Um, we have a very flat structure in, in our company. I mean. The, the partners and then everyone else. I mean, that, that literally is it. So I wouldn't be offended if, you know, a graduate engineer challenged me on something. Um, and I think it takes a lot to create a culture where, you know, a 22-year-old engineer feels empowered enough to disagree with me in a brainstorm, in a meeting, uh, for me to respect him. And that is, uh, you know, you can't sort of dictate that stuff. It's actually far more subtle. It's about creating an organization where, you know, when the boss walks in, everyone one doesn't stand up and you know how, how are you how are you possibly going to have a really creative environment when um, when you have an organization where everyone stands up and you know the boss is the hallowed guy and like I said the hippo method you know the highest paid person you know opinion thing um, you've got to get away from that and um, you know I think that's why it's been quite interesting hearing some of the big organizations that are starting to have little skunk works teams that are kind of operating uh, off grid um, because they're stepping away from all of that politics, all of that structure, all of that process, typically those teams will be very, very flat, very dynamic. Um, and I, I think those things, you know, maybe starting small and growing that sort of philosophy is, is a great place to start. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much again. My dad. <laughs> <laughs>